Hey guys, I really wanted to get this video out. We're going to talk about slotting on a brass instrument, okay? Like, particularly the trumpet, because that's what I play. The way people usually think about slots on a trumpet is like a, a circle or like a square, right? These are the different slots in the horn. Okay, like all these open overtones. So the way that I want you to think about these is like triangles. We should think of it as like a sound triangle, okay? So if you have the sound triangle over here, at the bottom of the triangle, you have the widest spot of the triangle, and then it comes to a point at the top. So at the bottom, you have the least amount of resistance, the most projection, and the most ring you can have in the sound, okay? And as you go up the triangle, the project the sound, gets more nasal, less projecting. There's a lot more back pressure, a lot more resistance. And the sound is just like, you know, it's not beautiful. <laughs> okay, and I can kind of demonstrate that now. So as you can see, my tuning slide is like pretty much all the way in. So I'm gonna play a scale with my slide here. So that's where I feel like it's the bottom of the triangle. Now I'm going to pull my slide out this much. Like, that's a lot. And I'm going to play the exact same pitch that I just played. And you tell me which one you'd rather listen to. Okay, this is really extreme, right? Let's do half that much, okay? Like, now I'm going to pull it out this much. But that's still not, that sound is still not as good as the first one. I mean, you can definitely hear the difference. What I'm getting at is, you know, what, what most trumpet players do when they get tired or and they're in a rehearsal and the, the, the conductor is like, hey, trumpet is sharp. You know, the first thing they do is reach for the slide and pull on it. And this is a death sentence, okay? There's no, if you took the A at the beginning of the rehearsal and you were in tune with your slide here, right? There's no way that your trumpet like got shorter during the course of the rehearsal. Something else has gone wrong and now you're gonna compensate for that by pulling your slide and now you've just given yourself a death sentence because now you've got more resistance, you got less projection, you got less beauty and ring in the sound, and now you're for sure going to get tired even faster. So when you're told that you're sharp, you gotta you you can't just reach for the slide right away. You have to think about, okay, maybe I'm starting to slouch. You know, maybe my posture's out of whack. Maybe I'm not breathing. Maybe I'm tight in the chest or whatever. You know, you have to think about what is the form you're holding behind the horn because there's no way that your trumpet got shorter over the course of a rehearsal. So this, this is a really important concept to think about, right? Be really careful when you, after you've already tuned and you've been playing in an ensemble for a while, that you suddenly start tugging on your, your main slide. You're gonna wear yourself out so much faster because you've already got this sound in your head that you wanna make, and then your horn is too long to produce the sound. So then you're going to start forcing and you're going to, what's going on? I can't get the, you know, it sound, doesn't sound good and the whole thing is going to collapse. My second point is slurring from the top of the triangle is really, really difficult, okay? The best place to slur from is at the bottom of the triangle. If you're at the bottom of the triangle, you can slur very easy. You can slur so easily from the bottom of the triangle, right? But if I start at the top of the triangle, pull my slide a bit, and then I'm going to play a sharp low C and try to slur to the G. It like takes a lot of effort to slur, right? But if you have, you know, if you slur from the bottom of one triangle to the bottom of the next tri triangle, it's so easy to slur. So easy to slur from the bottom of the triangle to the 
the bottom of the next triangle above. Like you see here, you have two triangles stacked on top of each other. When I teach note bending, I talk about bending notes down as far as you possibly can and let the note that comes out underneath it surprise you. So it looks like this. So you can hear that the, the note that I'm hitting, the G, when I, when I eventually get to that note, that G is right at the absolute bottom of that sound triangle. So if you can learn how to do it descending, your body will store that same information. So if you're able to do something descending, you can, your body will have that information inside um, about how to slur upwards as well. If you can do this, you can go. So anyway, that's it. that's it, guys. I really wanted to get this video out, and I hope I hope it gives you something to think about. Um, stay in the bottom of the triangle. You're going to have your biggest, most resonant, most projecting, awesome sound with the least amount of effort and the least amount of resistance. So that's part one of a two-part series for the sound triangle. The second part will definitely be as or more important than the first. It's going to talk about some other... Uh, things that are bound to be controversial, but again, in my experience, they work really well. And for a lot of other people, I'll try to describe them in, in ways that maybe you haven't heard about before. And as a final note, I just want to say, if you're out there and you're struggling with something, you want an objective opinion about your playing or concepts or whatever, um, I've been teaching for like almost 30 years now all over the world um, with pretty good results. And it's not because I think I'm a badass. I don't, okay? There's a lot of guys out there that play way better than me. But I can give you a no-nonsense, easy-to-understand opinion about what I think you're doing wrong that might get some traction and uh, add ballast to uh, what you may already su suspect about what's wrong when you're playing. I'm happy to do that anytime. There's no course to enroll in. There's no subscriptions or anything like that. You can just get in touch with me. My email address is here on the website, or you can go to johndante.com. I'll tell you up front, my lessons on Skype are about 75 U.S., Let's just call it 75 US. That's half my normal in-person rate when I teach at the conservatory and elsewhere. The lesson experience loses about 50% in my opinion because we can't be in person together. All the opinions and stuff, my analysis will be the same, but the better your microphone, the better your kit. When we're online together, the better the, you know, the better value it's gonna be for you. You get my undivided attention. We can talk about what you're doing and, and what you might think about doing to overcome whatever hurdles you're up against. And again, it's all in the spirit of discovery and improving without some uh, elaborate um, subscription-based uh, annoying. This is how you do it. This is how you must do it. This is, you know what I mean? If you're tired of that, definitely uh, get in touch with me if you're tired of that kind of stuff. I'm really no nonsense. Ask around if you don't believe me. My reviews of other guys' videos have gotten a lot of good reviews. Thank you very much. I'm in the process of making a new friend and we're gonna tag team some of the, the videos that are out there on the internet and it's it's not gonna make a lot of friends. It's, some people are gonna be really upset by it, but I don't care because it's just bad information. If it's not helpful and it's arrogant, that's two strikes already, okay? I'm not being arrogant. I'm not telling you I got the silver bullet for anything. All I'm telling you is I'm willing to help. I promise objectivity, okay? That's what I promise. I'm not gonna try to insist you do things my way or get you to buy a gadget or some other stupid thing that's probably not gonna help, okay? So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one.